Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much once again for this tremendous privilege, this honor of gathering together as family this evening. Thank you for truth that sets us free, Father. Thank you for giving us a peace that surpasses all human comprehension. And thank you for always making this church open by and through spiritual gifts that you've ordained from eternity past, that you've empowered by means of your spirit. Father, thank you so much for these things. May we never become familiar with them. We are most grateful and thankful, of course, for your son's work on the cross to cancel out that debt and to make an evening like this even a reality. We do just ask for your blessings on this evening's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Again, the peaceful fruit of righteousness, part four. It's interesting because, I don't know, I think I need to write a blog on this peaceful fruit of righteousness, but we'll see. There's just something fundamental to what the Spirit's trying to say to us on this topic of peaceful fruit. And I think you can just glaze over those kinds of passages, those phrases, peaceful fruit of righteousness. Um, and we ought not to do that because there's an awful lot uh, impregnated, if you would, into that short phrase, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Um, again, I think there's just something fundamental that the Spirit's trying to say on this topic of peaceful fruit. In fact, there's actually two key elements worth highlighting this evening before we even dig our heels into a review. First, there's the fruit of righteousness. You notice I left out the adjective. There's the fruit of righteousness part. We know beyond the shadow of a doubt that being right before God produces good fruit. Because all good things from heaven are good, we know that said fruit is good indeed. So that's the first part of the equation, the fruit of righteousness. The second part is the connection of peaceful to said fruit of righteousness. It's not just the fruit of righteousness, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So not to be all grammatical with you, um, but the word peaceful is an adjective. And adjectives are used to describe things. For example, if I tell you that I have a ball, you might imagine something spherical. Um, but the other attributes are going to have to be filled in by you. I can imagine Big Jim's thinking of a basketball. Scott, probably a football. Don't really want to know what the rest of you are thinking. <laughs> That's not true. However, if I say I have a large red bouncy ball, you now have a lot more information to reconstruct that which I have in my own head or in my hands at the time. Obviously, the more adjectives I use to describe the ball, the clearer the picture you have in your head about the ball itself. So I want you to concentrate. It seems like I'm carrying on, but I'm really not. I'm getting to something. First, you've got to concentrate. Not all adjectives are created equal. For example, I might say the ball is underinflated, like, say, Tom Brady's detractors said. But let's face it, unless you actually put an air pressure gauge on the ball, you'd never know. You'd never know. But the adjective is it's underinflated, but yet you'd never know. Yet, if I go on to describe what can only be a football to you, let's say, you understand a lot more about the object than something less perceptible, though no less an adjective, such as it being underinflated. My point is that the adjective in the phrase, the peaceful fruit of righteousness, describes the word fruit. We know that said fruit is the result of something because it says fruit of righteousness so it's the result of something namely righteousness we know that from english grammar proper even and to boot the spirits also proven this 
as factual through the evidence in Holy Scripture. That's been our endeavor so far in the series. So back to the adjective. Again, the point on the board, not all adjectives are created equal. The adjective peaceful is a really big word. It's not like underinflated. It's a big word. Peaceful is a really big adjective. Not all adjectives are created equal, but peaceful is almost supremely large. So let me give you some insight into what the Spirit was revealing to me as He was preparing me for this message. And I need you to concentrate because I'm going to throw a lot on the table before we weave it together. So these are, the, these are the things that the Spirit had me think about. Like I said, He stalled me before I even got started in the lesson, before I got into any point of review. He said, I need you to stop right here. Maybe you'll write a blog on it, maybe you won't. Maybe you're going to teach it and I'll let it go don't know. This is how he kind of grips me sometimes. And he, then he floods me with all kinds of things to think about and says, make some sense of this and then teach it. So consider the following things. You might call it nouns, let's say, since adjectives describe nouns. The essence of God, just thinking about God himself. God is love, 1 John 4.16. God is manifest justice and righteousness. Psalm 89, 14. God is Jesus Christ. John 10, 30. God is eternal life. 1 John 5, 20. Just thinking of those things. Now what I want you to synthesize here is the word peaceful as an adjective that describes everything you see on the board right now. Peaceful describes all this. In other words, peaceful can be used to describe the very essence of God. Not just His righteousness. Not just righteousness, even. Peaceful can be used to describe the very essence of God. If there's any, any person uh, that's at peace, it's God. Perfect peace, always. That's why we saw peace in Jesus Christ. Because it was, He was God incarnate. So, peaceful can be used to describe the very essence of God. Obviously, there's much more to the essence of God than just what's listed there on the board, but you get the point of the exercise, I hope. What you'll begin to realize is that this peaceful fruit of righteousness, with emphasis on peaceful at this point, begins to describe much more than just a single noun. It describes much more than just the fruit of righteousness. Peaceful is a very big word. In other words, we don't just experience peace here and there. It becomes something linked with the very essence of God and His divine attributes, as John describes it. Go to 1 John 4.16. 1 John 4.16, as John describes it. First John 4.16. First John 4.16, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, matured, if you would, even, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. Verses 16 and 17 are manifestations of peace. When you read that, can you describe it? Not really. But you know that when you read that, and if you believe it, and if you're a believer in Christ, you have peace. And we're talking about God's love. Up here on the board, peaceful fruit. Our access to divine peace is not a function of fruit, strictly speaking, but rather a function of being in Christ, in God, in the sphere of, of peace itself. I hope that makes sense. Our access to divine peace is not a function of fruit, strictly speaking, 
but rather a function of being in Christ, in God, in the sphere of peace itself. Peace is a transcendent state of being, of living, of abiding experientially. When we received Christ in us, we were given access to His peace. That's fruit of righteousness because you had then been given what we would call imputed righteousness. His righteousness was assigned to your account even. Therefore, God is satisfied. Uh, and that's when we are given uh, access to His peace. Stated more succinctly, peace is the fruit of being righteous. Peace is, I hope you see it, is the fruit. Being at peace, having peace, being in the sphere of peace is the fruit of being righteous. So think about it. We don't know, I'm thinking about the actual phrase, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. We don't know exactly what fruit the writer of Hebrews is speaking of specifically. Only that whatever fruit it is, being righteous, it is peaceful. It's almost a variable form, if you would. Only that whatever fruit it is, being righteous, it is peaceful. In other words, it doesn't matter what the fruit is of righteousness, because it will always carry with it peace. It, in other words, let me put it this way. Is it righteous to love one another? Yes. Is it righteous to forgive one another? Yes. Is it righteous to confess your sins? Yes. All three of those carry with it peace. That's the peaceful fruit of righteousness. You did three different right things, correct? And every single time you have peace. You see, peace is a big word. It's transcendent. It's not exclusive to this thing or this thing or this thing. As is God. As is the essence of God. That's why you can get really goofy with God when you try to over-doctrinalize him or hyper-doctrinalize God. You know, you start categorizing him and this time. And then, then he just, he's basically whittled down to a bunch of categorical, you know, 1A, 2B, part 1, 3C. That's God? No, that's not God at all. That's not God at all. God is a person. So, again, it doesn't matter what the fruit of righteousness or what the fruit is of righteousness because it will always carry with it peace. Since everyone wants this kind of peace, we want to know how to receive it, at least I do, up here on the board, the gateway, if you want to call it that, to actually experiencing said peace is in obedience, a.k.a. being righteous through the power of the Spirit and His Word. Our free will decides on experiential reception of God's peace. When we obey God, we receive it. That's how it goes. This is what we've been learning. If you want to disobey God, then you will be miserable even as a believer. He will correct you, and you will begin be more miserable until you repent. Like, say, I don't know, Job, when he got a little loose there. I repent in dust and ashes. After God said, oh yeah? Gird your loins, young fella. When God says, gird your loins to you, that's about the time you want to repent. <laughs> uh. So the gateway to actually experiencing said peace is in obedience. Our free will decides on experiential reception of God's peace. When we obey God, we receive it. Luke eleven twenty eight part B, up here on the board. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. So to net this out, to obey is to be righteous before God. Righteousness implies orientation to the holy God of the universe, the one who is uniquely able 
to bless you. Blessings from God always include some facet of peace. Blessings from God always includes some facet of peace. Remember why all the complexity and chaos? The idea is to get to a peaceful place, a place where there's not so much of that. The idea is that God delivers us from this chaos to the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. And so you see this sort of calming down effect, this peaceful fruit of righteousness effect. Because as he sanctifies you, he makes you more righteous in time, even experientially. And as that thing happens, things calm down. And no matter what he's using to deliver you, it could be this part of your life, this part of your life, this part of your life, moving in this direction, things are getting simpler and more pure and therefore more peaceful. And that's what the point is this evening, out of the gate. Blessings from God always include some facet of peace because ultimately a blessing is a form of deliverance. For example, is it fair to say that you have peace when you abide in God's love? Is it fair to say that you have peace when you abide in God's justice and righteousness? Is it fair to say that you have peace knowing that you are secure in Christ Jesus? And is it fair to say that you have peace being convinced that you have eternal life? All yeses, right? Do you realize we just covered the contents of our previous slide? That's what the Spirit's trying to say. That peace is a really big adjective. It's a really big word. And it's not assigned to one particular fruit. God is love. God is manifest justice and righteousness. God is Jesus Christ. God is eternal life. All these things carry with them peace. So let's traverse each of these principles now so that the Spirit can really drive home the transcendent aspects of this series on the peaceful fruit of righteousness. First, God is love, as we just noted. You're in 1 John 4, correct? Verse 16 reads, We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. I don't know about you, but that makes me very peaceful. Knowing that God loves me that much, not only did he die for me, but he invites me into the sphere of his love. Well, that brings me peace. And it ought to bring you peace. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Does reading this bring you peace? Of course. Second, God is justice and righteousness. Go to Psalm 89.14. Psalm 89.14. Psalm 89.14. fourteen. Psalm 89, 14. Psalm 89, verse 14. So you have to ask yourself, do these things bring you peace? Of course. Second, God is justice and righteousness. Psalm 89, 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Loving kindness and truth go before you. Does reading this bring you peace? Yep. Of course. How about third? God is Jesus Christ. Go to John 10, 27. God is Jesus Christ. John 10, 27. All these things point to the peaceful fruit of righteousness. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Does reading that bring you peace? I hope so. And lastly, from our short list, God is eternal life. Go to 1 John 5.19. 1 John 5.19. We're just surveying it at this point just so you see what the Spirit's trying to say, even experientially, 1 John 5, 19. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that 
we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Does that bring you peace? It should. So I hope you see what the Spirit's trying to develop in your soul with this short list on the board. What he's doing is elevating your perspective to the divine level. To the divine level, at least to whatever degree that is possible. It is certainly um, far above normal human rationalistic thinking. For peace experienced by unbelievers is a product of earthly circumstances. Again, peace experienced by unbelievers is a product of earthly circumstances. As Jesus described it, earthly righteousness has nothing to do with God. Therefore, such righteousness, no matter how earnestly it is practiced or even achieved, has no part in God's grace, or excuse me, God's peace even. For as we've been noting, we believers receive his peace as a function of righteousness. We believers receive his peace as a function of righteousness. In other words, Peace is a function of something godly, something given to us by the grace of God alone. Things like we just reviewed in our short list, love, Christ, eternal life, etc. Let's see what Jesus said about divine perspective on the righteousness of man versus that of God. And keep in mind the two different types of peace in view as a result. Go to Matthew 6 verse 1 Matthew 6 1 What did Jesus have to say? And keep in mind two different types of peace. Peace from the world comes from the world. Peace from above comes from above. Matthew 6:1 Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. We already know that's bad motivation. Therefore, you're not even seeking God's peace. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Do you really think you're going to be conveyed divine peace under those circumstances? Obviously, no. And those are Jesus' own words. Go to uh, verse 2. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. He's not saying that there aren't rewards, earthly rewards. He's saying, but they're not mine. That's the difference. If you want peace from the world, then run after it. You'll get some worldly form of peace. I don't know, maybe they'll leave you alone because they certainly bother the heck out of us, amen? Right? Maybe they'll leave you alone. Maybe that's your form of peace. But that's not from God. How about verse 5? When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. In other words, that's as good as it gets. If you want to be a hypocrite, that's as good as it gets. If you want poor motivation, that's not fruit of righteousness. That's fruit of unrighteousness. If you want poor motivation, then you are not going to get peace from me. You might get something from the world because the world loves its own. Jesus said that too. How about verse 16? Verse 16, whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. For they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. The world will give you, the world will give you something. It's just not going to be what the Bible describes as godly peace. So we saw, though, it's interesting because what, what word did we see three times there? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. Three times. Let me give you a little... I think I've given you this word in the past. I'll just give you the brief overview. Hypocrisy, according to Jesus, the Greek root of this word, hypocrisy, means to wear a mask as in a theater. That's what a hypocrite means. 
to wear a mask as in a theater. That's where it came from, the Greek root of hypocrisy. Practicing righteousness for the approbation of others is like wearing a mask. It is disingenuous before God. God does not bless hypocrites. Man does. If you want to be blessed by the world, then do as the world would like. Be a hypocrite. I mean, think about it. Every unbeliever is basically a hypocrite. Read Romans 1. They are actively suppressing God, something that was put there by God, their creator, and they're acting like the creator doesn't exist. That's what we call first-class acting. Every unbeliever is an actor. And you know what? God does not bless hypocrites, people who wear masks. We just saw that. But man will, that's the thing. Everybody put on a mask. Everybody try to be like, I don't know, your favorite actor or your favorite movie star or your favorite musician, whoever it is you're chasing after. I want to be like somebody. It's never me, but it's somebody. And they're wearing a mask, and it's a big old, you know, charade. God doesn't bless that. Man will, though. Man will. Peace, being a primary blessing from God, is among the things that God withholds from hypocrites. So let's review our key principles this evening before we press on with our review, picking up where we left off on Tuesday. Again, we've seen this already up here on the board, peaceful fruit. Our access to divine peace is not a function of fruit, strictly speaking, but rather a function of being in Christ in God, in the sphere of peace itself. Peace is a transcendent estate of being, of of living, of abiding experientially. When we received Christ in us, we were given access to this peace, His peace, up here on the board. The gateway to actually experiencing said peace is in obedience, a.k.a. being righteous through the power of the Spirit and His Word, Our free will decides on experiential reception of God's peace. How's that? When we obey, we receive it. When we obey, we receive it. Again, how do we know? Not because Pastor Ed says it. I'm not trying to be some legalistic person trying to put you on some formula because this is not formulaic, okay? Luke 11, 28. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. I did not say that. That's the word of God. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Obey, in other words. Live by it, in other words. Take the mask off. If the word says there are none righteous, take the mask off. And look at how ugly you are without Christ. And be thankful. That's a good starting point. We call that humility. But if you want to walk around with a mask on, the world's going to love you. Because that's what the world loves. Take the mask off and they call you hideous. Ooh, Ooh, put the mask back on. You're hideous. I know. That's why I love Jesus. I encourage each of you to take these thoughts with you and spend some real, real quiet time with the Spirit in prayer. That doesn't mean with earphones in. That doesn't mean playing a video game. doesn't mean watching television. doesn't mean on your drive to work. Oh, yeah, that's where I get all my... No, 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 that's not quiet time. Good luck quiet time driving in in Massachusetts traffic. I'm going to beg to differ with you. That's That's not quiet time. So I encourage you, take these things and spend some quality, quiet time. Quality, quiet time with the Spirit in prayer. Don't pray behind a wheel. It's bad enough texting. All right, with that said, let's take that with us and as we continue with our series titled 
the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And that's something a half an hour of teaching on one thought before the Spirit would let this man continue with what he thought was going to be a review right out of the gate. He said, stop right there. Goes to show. Um, I mean, it's a good example of how he might stop you. And if you're listening, and you know it took longer than a half an hour to put this together. So he had me on hold for a while, thinking, looking at scripture, synthesizing, you know, asking him, you know, taking a break even, walking around the house, talking to the dog, talking to God, you know, talking to the dog, talking to God. Dog's like, let me out of here. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? That's what it means to do this thing. And it's interesting because if he can do that much with, you know, who the heck am I with me? Then he can do the same thing with you, if you're willing. If you're willing. It's up to you. So far in our highlight reel in this series, uh, we've been brought back to this. Uh, quite often already. First John 5.17, part A says, All unrighteousness is sin. Whatever is not right is sin because it is wrong. Duh. Whatever our good conscience convicts us of, we must obey the Spirit and do what's right. I could have written that, by the way. Whatever the Spirit convicts us of, we must obey our good conscience and do what's right. They're interchangeable in that sentence. Either way, the idea is to do what's right. And the spirit and your conscience work together. James 4.17. Second, we've seen this quite a few times. Unrighteousness equals sin equals discord, which is a lack of peace. What we've learned is that peace is the result of our Lord's promise to give it. My peace I leave with you, he said. However, we've also learned that such promises are conditioned experientially upon our obedience. And I just gave you a few, a smattering of passages that prove that very point. For example, Psalm 112.1. Praise the Lord. How blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. Well, if you agree that peace is a blessing, then you get it when you delight in his commandments, when you receive them, when you abide in them. So you see, whether we like it or not, whether it's fashionable or not, obedience is key. It's just such an unpopular term, isn't it? especially in such an anti-authority oriented culture that we live in. You know, you realize that's what's happening, right? America is trying to flatten authority orientation. It's squeeze it all the way down so that you're the king. Everybody is their individual king and there's no authority structure because that's what the world says. Flatten it all down. You can't trust anybody up there. They're a bunch of idiots. You ever hear? All right, go to a smoking area at a factory. <laughs> My boss is the biggest bum loser idiot. My God. College graduate. What an idiot. Right? And I'm not picking on smoking. This is, this is what I've seen, right? Go, nobody's happy with management ever. Even in a church, by the way, right? Nobody's ever happy with management. So what do they do? Squash it down. What does the world say? Buck management. Buck the authority. Be your own king. Everybody's worthy of being king, right? Yeah. There's no blessing in that. That's what the Lord's saying. You'd be a lot happier if you're just oriented to the authority I put in your life. Because all authority is from me. So says God. So just orient to it. <laughs> nope. I don't like obedience. It gives me the jeebies. You know? I don't like it. So, but whether we like it or not, is the point. Obedience is key, however impossible, in the absence of humility. See, an arrogant person is always looking for loopholes. Well, the guy's a real jackass, so you're a jackass for saying it. You're a jackass for being out in the smoking area. My boss is a jackass. What kind of fruit is that bearing? All you're doing is sowing discord in a workplace. Making the poor other guy who's like, man, I knew I shouldn't have come out at 10. I should have waited until 11 because now i got to listen to this jackass complain about my boss. I really don't want to hear it. i got enough problems. Now i got to have this in my soul. 
Maybe it's right, maybe it's not. Got you guessing though, didn't I? Oh. Let's start a few rumors. Let's get the rumor mill going. Right? Another bad place? You guys, some of you know I taught in uh, two different high schools for a year, and then I like peeled out of there. Right? The teacher's room. First of all, you got to come in like this. There's a smoke. <coughs> they don't do that anymore, but anyways. Right? Like, and they're all complaining about everything. I don't want to hear it. I'll go eat my lunch at my desk. Anyways, I digress. But it's all part of this. Do you understand? It's all part of it. It's all part of what Satan's trying to do in people's lives. Because obedience is key. As a sort of balance statement, though, nonetheless, fair expectations towards ourselves, while it's true that when we are saved, we are changed internally, we are new creatures in Christ, all the external forces in our lives do not magically change as well. It takes a little time to turn the Titanic around, in other words. But this gives us peace. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Awesome. But there's a little thing called life and the momentum associated with it. And so we're just saying, hey, be fair. It takes a while to sanctify us. And we have to show ourselves even a little grace because we have bad habits. Who, 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 came, oh, who was one day not saved, the next day they're saved, all their bad habits were gone? That person's a liar. I've, heard actually, I've actually heard pastors say that before. I'm like, you're a liar. There is no way that every bad habit you've ever had all of a sudden magically went away because you love Jesus so much. Stop being, take the mask off. As is always the case, it seems, the Spirit has refused to let us off the hook without a solid bit of introspection like this. Practical implies practice. Oh, man, another P word. Patience being the other one, huh? Huh, Scotty? Yeah. This is what it means to think of these messages in a practical way. It means we are looking to practice that which is pleasing to our Lord. That's what it means to be practical. Why bother talking about practical issues from the pulpit if you're not willing to practice them? Why talk about all this practicality if you're not going to do anything to orient to God that's pleasing to Him? The wonderful thing about practice is that it bears good fruit. Imagine that. Practice actually bears good fruit. We might even say peaceful fruit of righteousness. Because to practice what is right is actually righteousness, which bears fruit, which, as we just talked about the first half of class, bears peace. Always carries with it some form or aspect of peace. So, encouraging fruit up here on the board, still in review. Fruit is a practical device that God uses to prove to us that he is actually sanctifying us. Peace is a primary fruit of righteousness. Who's going to say 10 years ago you had more peace than you do right now? If you do, something's wrong. You've been, I don't know what you've been doing other than maybe growing roots in that chair. I'm serious. Peace, having more peace in your life as a result of growing up spiritually is fruit in of itself. Knowing that you have more peace. Reflecting back and saying, you know, I am at more peace. Now, I'm not talking about little, like, you know, the stock market. We have ups and downs and you're so close to the fire. You don't understand. I have less now than I ever did. Step back for a moment. Stop being a little candy. Do you know what I'm saying? No, seriously. You're, all right, so you're having a bad day or a bad week or whatever, even a month. You know what I mean? Get over yourself. I'm talking about trends here. Look, go all the way back. Stop being immature. Go all the way back 10 years and say, okay, okay, God sanctified me. <laughs> like a little adolescent child does, right? Oh, I guess so. <laughs> so this series is really trying to establish some fun, a foundational work in us as follows up here on the board. The Spirit is trying to create 
a string of connective tissue between the love that flows forth from God himself to the resultant peace we have in our souls. He loves us, so he sanctifies us. When he sanctifies us, we bear fruit. When we bear fruit, it's peaceful. Always carries with it peace, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. He delivers us. He disciplines us. He does anything it takes to set us free from the bondage, the chaos, the complexity of where we just came from. Because, again, it takes a while to turn the ship around. Great, we're saved. Now what? You've got quite a walk in front of you. ship was going in the wrong direction for years. Time to turn this thing around. It's going to take a little while. And that's what he's saying. The more you obey my commands, first and foremost, how about learning the word of God? How about that for a command? How about submitting to a pastor? How about that for a command? How about obeying authorities in your life? How about that for a command? How about all those little commands? You know the ones that you don't like to obey? Yeah. The ones that are antagonistic to your momentum that you took with you that you didn't just magically drop somehow when you were saved. We ended Sunday with this principle. And we didn't review this far on Tuesday, so this is about as far as we've gotten in my notes. Peace from obedience. If we want peace, we must obey God's commands. Obedience implies very practical lifestyle choices. And I know that's hard. I know it is. When your lifestyle is a train and it's going that direction, it's hard to pull the brake. Say, okay, we're going to turn this thing around. It's going to take a while. It's going to be a lot of pain. People are going to get off that train, right? Your friends. How many friends have you lost? I bet you I've lost at least that many. It's unbelievable. I'm not being, okay, drama king, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I didn't mean to say it that way, but you know what I'm saying? I lost a lot of friends. I can't even go on Facebook anymore because it's their people are rude. People that loved me. You understand? I was like Mr. Popularity back in high school. I got a lot of friends on Facebook. They don't even talk to me anymore. One of them called me a Nazi. Because I said, well, the Bible says homosexuality is a sin. How did I ever become friends with you, you Nazi fascist pig or something? I'm like, what in the heck? This is publicly. So when you turn the, when you turn the train around, they're going to be getting off. They're going to be, stop this train. You're pulling that thing on the subway. I'm off. I'm off the Ed train. I'm off the so-and-so train. I'm off that train. I don't want anything to do with you anymore. Okay, But that's hard, isn't it? Because some of these people you care about. Some of these people you've known. My best from high school, he comes into town now, doesn't even call me anymore. My best friend. Up until I was teaching, he'd come into town, we'd go out, go to a game or something like that, blah, blah. Doesn't even call me anymore. I'm fine with it, because I don't believe he's a believer, but he doesn't want anything to do with me, so what am I going to do? That's what it takes. And all of you can relate, I'm sure. That's why I'm hoping that all the work that it takes to keep this church intact is worth it to you. That you have a place of, of protection and comfort and peace that you can come to and enjoy the things that we ought to be able to enjoy in Christ Jesus, not be antagonized like we are even from the so-called friends we have as uh, King David might say, uh, that hurt us. So anyways, if we want peace, we must obey God's commands. Obedience implies very practical lifestyle choices, not just mental assent to obedience. While we can't fake it till we make it, we can at least humble ourselves, learning humility through life itself. God gives faith, Romans 12, 3, that leads to obedience, that leads to peace. That's the chain, if you would. So, with all of that on the table, let's get to the passage that we took note of way back and has been the impetus for this evening's message as well as the three previous. I mean, we've been hinging on this phrase, the peaceful fruit of righteousness, and I think it came out like two weeks ago. I haven't even gotten back to it yet. We're just leading up to it. Okay, go to Hebrews 12, 1. Hebrews 12, verse 1. So now we're forging a little new ground.
Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. I just talked about that. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, because it's going to be hard. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We just talked about this. This is all what's going on in all of our lives. I mean, he had a much greater cross to bear, but we're to carry our own cross. So says Holy Scripture. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood, and you're striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. How easily we forget, in other words. How easily we forget. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Up here on the board. Discipline is only necessary because of the existence of disobedience. The Lord disciplines those he loves because he wants them to enjoy his peace. Verse 7. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. In other words, if you're not being disciplined, something's wrong. If God's not disciplining you, something's wrong with your so-called faith. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. After you've been trained by the Lord, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Up here on the board, I'll give you the amplified of verse 11 as well, just to clarify, to highlight, emphasize. For the time being, no discipline brings joy, but seems sad and painful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness, right standing with God, and a lifestyle and attitude that seeks conformity to God's will and purpose. Again, right standing with God and a lifestyle and attitude that seeks conformity to God's will and purpose. That's the reason for these lessons. That's why we get introspective. That's why I give you those principles from every which angle. That's why we have good laughs together. It's because we're idiots. Our lifestyles still stink in some areas. And he's trying to sanctify us, and we're dragging our feet. And some of us have been at it so long, we've got no more fingernails left from holding on. They're all gone, and we still won't let go. Now we're biting the turf. For me, it's easy. I can put a lot of pressure because of these teeth. <laughs> Kathy, that's not funny. <laughs> Kathy with the perfect teeth never needed braces. Actually, you're the only one that got braces, and you didn't even need them. <laughs> I did. My mother's like, too bad we've got to pay rent. Totally a lie. <laughs> Ed Collins, brace is fun. It's never too late. Right standing with God in a lifestyle and attitude that seeks conformity to God's will and purpose. That's what this is all about. You see? And he's saying if you just, if you, if you listen, if you obey what I'm telling you, you will have the 
peaceful fruit of obeying what I tell you. Obeying what I tell you, righteous. Being righteous. When you obey, you're right. When you're right, you have peace. Who doesn't want peace? So what exactly is the Bible telling us here? Up here on the board, the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Peace is a function of righteousness. Righteousness is a function of obedience, of faith, both at salvation, when it is imputed, and experientially, when it is imparted. Peace reigns in the heart and soul of God. Saying, if you want some of what I have, come with me. Follow me. And like dumb sheep, sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Jesus Christ, the great shepherd, the staff gently guides us, the rod whacks us. In both cases, they're to orient us to him and therefore his peace. He said, my peace I give to you. You're not going to have it if you keep running over in the thicket. I will rip you out. I'm going to tear you out. You're going to be moaning. Maybe you'll be the adolescent. I'm going to tear you out and bring you back. And the whole time you'll be dragging your feet. For a moment, it's going to seem unhappy and not joyful, right? But once you're trained, you reap the benefits. That's Hebrews 12. That's the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So when we ponder this, we have to step way back and look at the big picture. And I'll, I guess I'll end with this. Hmm. When we ponder this, when we go way back and look at the big picture and think about peace, in all truth, isn't that what, isn't that what peace demands from us? I mean, I don't read in the Bible that God wants us to say, okay, when I read this one verse, or when I think about this one thing in my life, then I can have peace. That's not it at all. That's not it at all. It's the fruit of righteousness, and it's peaceful. A fruit could be anything, any good fruit, any good fruit of obeying God, of being right before God. Thinking, lifestyle, practice, practical, however you'd like to look at it. Whatever that is. Being right before God bears fruit. And a primary fruit is peace itself. So isn't that what peace demands from us? That we step way back? I mean, we'd be doing peace a disservice if we get too close and try to, you know, wrangle it into a box and say, well, I'm going to get peace this way. If I just do these four sides of the equation, if I balance the equation then I get peace. It doesn't work that way. You have to step way back, even all the way to the essence of God. I mean, isn't peace a big picture emotion even? Isn't peace itself a response to God and His love for you? Isn't peace a big picture emotion? Doesn't it demand you to step back? I mean, doesn't, in other words, if you're going through some suffering, it's hard when you're this close to the fire, right, because it burns. The only way you can find peace in the middle of tribulation is to step way back. Is that fair? Is to rise above. Maybe that's better. Maybe we go this way. To rise above the problem. To say, this is just a skirmish. This is just a kingdom of darkness trying to get the best of me. I've been here, done it a thousand times. It hurt, It burns. I mean, you didn't think Jesus was, uh, his lungs were burning on the cross? But he rose above, and he had a peace. And that's what he wants us to do. And that's what peace demands of us. It demands a big picture viewpoint. Because that's exactly what it is. It's always having the gospel, uh, having your purpose in life. If, you've got, if you suck at your job, no offense. Right? You always have the gospel. If you're the worst at whatever you're thinking of right now, it doesn't matter because you always have the gospel and you always have a purpose. You can always go out and give somebody the good news. That makes you a king. That makes you golden. That makes you everything that the world wants to tell you you are but can't. 
The world says, oh, go do this and, you know, go cure cancer. And I'm not having a problem with doctors. You know what I'm saying? Go do this and then you'll have a real purpose. No. All I need is the gospel. That's my real purpose here. All this other stuff is extraneous white noise. Details of life. God forbid I get sucked into the American dream or whatever the heck you want to call it. The lie. I mean, that's what life is about, and that's where you find peace. When you orient to God and His will for you. Isn't that what we just read in the Amplified? Right standing with God in a lifestyle and attitude that seeks conformity to God's will and purpose. That's where the peaceful fruit of righteousness comes in. That's all He's trying to do, is orient you to Him. Amen? All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege of learning your word and contemplating things that matter most in this world and this life that you've given us. Thank you for sending your son to redeem us and thank you for reminding us that we have a real purpose in this life that is completely opposite of what the world will try to sell us. Thank you for keeping our heads clear on the subject and thank you for giving us the opportunity to bring all these things out to a world that's just lost and decaying. What a privilege this is. May we never become familiar with it. We just ask your blessings as we take these things again out and we ask these things in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit we do pray. Amen. Thank you.